in terms of the unique identifier, the combination of the museum code, collection code, catalog number, and maybe a specimen number, that's what I generally use. Do you think that's, is that sufficient, or um, do you really need to have a, an assigned, uh, some, some of the identifiers you talked about? Yeah, um, so, this partially this would be my opinion that if you do that, I would register at viralrepositories.org or bioflexions index or whatever it's when it comes to one thing they are working. Okay. Make sure you register there. Uh, I do think <coughs> that that and this record identifier would be this notion that, <coughs> that that would work. Um, is it the registering that makes that work? Right. Yeah, definitely. Right? Yeah, I mean we're we're in the um, Biodiversity DRC. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes, right. So um, I just I guess I like that intuitively as, a, as an identifier because you can understand it. I mean if you know a little bit about collections that AMP, fish, so number, specimen. And if you can you can search on that, you can Google search that too and link yeah. up to the literature that might have cited that AMP number. Right. Maybe not in terms of fish specifically, but I mean, it, it, it has a history. Um, it has more more uh, intrinsic information than just a, a string. Of, I, I don't understand the barcode thing. I don't know why that's more useful than just like that example you gave with the YPM and the numbers. I mean, the technology is advancing so much where right. instead of a barcode, you could just put an OCR reader or something and get that. Oh, yeah. uh, you need thing, before, you know, bar, why not, you know, why, why barcode that? The, information, the unique uh, combination is already there. So, there's, we can have a long discussion, and I'll, I'll try to make this short. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to all these choices. There is a perfect choice. So, when you say that this string is intuitive because I can read it, um, the idea would be, I am W. Paul, right? And that name works in this room now, which I am. But as soon as I walk out the door, that name is no longer big enough. Now, in the context of this specimen identifier, the fact that you say that it's intuitive, what if you give that specimen away? Then what, I'm just saying that's Yeah, no, I mean, you gave the example of, of museums uh, adopting new codes and that, but I still think it's a, it's a legacy, it becomes a legacy Identifier, so and you can still trace. You can still trace the that's history. That's right. That's right. So here's my my point is also that if you if you did give it away, the next place that holds that has perfect. It would be perfectly fine for them to use the same string. But the confusing part is for humans, because humans are going to look at US MS or USNM or VSU or OSU, and they're going to go, oh, that belongs to They can't help themselves. Right. They really can't. Um, so they would need to then look at the owner ID field or some other field and say, oh, yes, the string implies that it belongs. I tried to make that very clear to you that the Pensoft identifier is a, that's that DOI is a clear example of that. If that publication goes and gets managed by another company, they're not going to change that string. So that 10 point whatever will no longer right. mean. I guess and, you and so I think what I'm trying to tell you is that's fine if you do that, and what I would suggest then, for example, and a collection comes along and you gift that away to them, mm -hmm. then in their database, they make standard practice, they may assign their own identifier. But you see what's happening here, you're going to get this plethora. But when you store that one, your new one, then in your database, you have a field for saying formerly known as, like you do with previous catalog number. Only in this case, you're going to need. So Mark, is your domain in that identifier? Uh, a A A S T or whatever your domain name is for the Nah, uh, we just moved to Jackson server, so <laughs> <laughs> So I mean that, that that's a good example.
tension in this room went up when you said everybody <laughs> should use the same thing. Because that scares people to death. Yeah, that's right. That's why I, that's why I, I sort of. Yeah, right. And we just really, we want you to send data, guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we, we, we definitely want an identifier of some type, and that is a very important thing. The direction that identifier goes per institution might be different, but it's very important that those things become globally unique so that your records can be resolved. So, so I don't want to say the, the, all, right? the catalog number, this is that may continue to be just like you've always done it for your <coughs> But the thing that you call your specimen identifier that digitally goes out with this, so you'll share your barcode and you may share your catalog number, but you can have this specimen identifier of whatever format that it is like in your Darwin core that be mapped to your current ID field, that that be I think we, the other thing to remember is you don't want to accumulate these identifiers over time for one yeah. specimen. Yeah. No, yeah. But, no. but that's, that's exactly my, that's my problem. My point is that changing yeah, it every time. So we, we already we already have multiple identifiers for things because of legacy data, so we still need to take the old ones with care and share them. And there's actually a way in our core and extension now with the resource relationship to do that. Uh, but let's so I, I just want to say something real quick. I'm involved with this collections web community building project, and it's a very, you know, these discussions are very sensitive. Any, any discussions about, you know, what database you should be using, or what kind of standard you should, you should follow, is very sensitive to the community, and there's a lot of distrust for the community because the, you know, the informatics people say you should do things one way, and then a month or two later, they change. Yes. You know, it, it's yes. evolving yes. Darwin Core standard. What I found very helpful in you know looking, you know, try to look across the landscape and make recommendations that don't evolve. Okay, mm -hmm. and one of the things that is helpful in this discussion is to separate the specimen ID from any notion of how it might change its name. It's because it is, it's a specimen. I don't what know, we call I don't, it can change. I think that's a what great idea, but why not? I, I don't want to manage that. In other words, why don't mm -hmm. I just, like, so we, like the, the model for, for doing this, I think, is that, you know, you have your, your collections doing whatever kind they want, but they have this one, the Darwin hardware export, and I get bio or some, or, or the hub, they manage the specimen identifiers, they handle those translations, and, and but you, so like, like, you like, want, so, okay, so, like the service um, in California. Wait, what time is it? I just want to know. I want time to know. You're, you're good. Okay, well. We got to plan this in. This, this, this could go on for the rest of the week. So, so part of this 
conversation has been that that's why I started out with what I did. Separating how to get to something and separating where to get something turns out to be less confusing for the humans, but the humans keep wanting to do what you're talking about. My idea would be that, in other words, if you were going to use the UID, and that was your specimen identifier digitally on the web, you would still share institution code, collection code, and catalog number in the Darwin core fields. So people can still look at the data and go, okay. Or they can look, there's a field owner, owner ID, for example, owner institution ID. You guys have a repository, right? In your database, a lot of times, the repository field. Mm -hmm. uh, so ownership would be of the physical specimen is indicated in a different field. Instead of inside the identifier, as Hank was pointing out, making the identifier identify the specimen, not identify the owner, not identify the how and the where, but only the what. Right. Okay, so let me let me go on this side of the room. Because there were people with their hands up over here. Yes? No? Your answer questions that I answered. No? Jen, you want to drop it one last time? I just want to say one more thing. The creating your own digital identifier that includes the specimen number or however you do it, or if it's opaque okay, UUID, we still need to get the data aggregators to accept that and, and use that. Because right now, GBIT is assigning their own UUID to your specimen. Even if you have one, they're assigning another. So, yeah, I wouldn't, so, mind, I wouldn't mind that. I no, mean, no, no. Well, aggregators, I mean, so aggregators will always do that because they have to organize the data and find relationships between the data. But those are not, but we are, for example, at ID Buyer, if you go and look right now, you'll see our identifier that we've assigned to an object, but you'll also see the provider identifier. You see, and you can search by your own identifiers in our database, etc. So, so you, um, but yeah, that's always going to happen. And GBIF is also moving toward this notion of making sure that that occurrence ID that people provide is unique. It, they're making changes as well. Yes. But it doesn't necessarily have to happen. <coughs> right. I mean, yeah. having, having <laughs> GUIDs on top of GUIDs on top of LSIDs on top of UUIDs on top of specimen numbers, oh. it's just an absolute waste of time. Well, what we need to do is we need to get to a centralized, a centralized repository I, of a single format of UUIDs that is accepted by everybody, and UUIDs are assigned to the specimens in the collection, and those are then resolved by the centralized repository of resolvers. Yeah, and it may and very well be that kind of, I mean, we're experimenting with that with our I mean, to see how that's going to work. The, the, the two on. biggest problems are um, the question of whether these UIDs should be human readable or whether they should be opaque. And the other one is, how do these UUIDs stay with the specimens? Because even if you gift a specimen to somebody else, the only thing you're going to send them is a catalog number. You're not oh. going to send them the UUID. Oh, I, I, um, so the UUID yes. is not going to stay with the specimen. But that's my point. That's why I was trying to say, when you share your data, and that's one of the nice things about somebody bothered to take resource relationship um, class in Garland or make an extension out of it, is that you need community practices, just like you share it with you. Oh, exactly. When you guys have different determination IDs, you don't get rid of the old ones. I mean, we know that if you go into a barbarian, you've got, you look at the darn sheet, you can see them all. You know, right. the physical sheet. That's going to change too. People are going to make annotations on the web. And that annotation may or may not be physically placed back on the original sheet. So the database is integral. It's now integral. It has to go with things. But can't so, the on the on the aggregator side, can't they figure out what lots? Can't they just go through and be like, oh, that ANSP number has an X R number, and then combine those so, lots? Right. So that is uh, parts of bicycle, yes, and filter push, yes, and things like scatter, gather, reconcile. Do those kinds of inference work? To figure out that things are the same or maybe related, come from the same collecting unit. But we would like it to be the kind of situation where if the identifiers are shared, this same as this, this formerly known as this, this is a derivative of this. If you have these identifiers for these things, then these relationships are very rich and you can do a lot of fun stuff with the data if we have this kind of information. We're not, we are accustomed to storing it. We store all these different determinations, formerly determined as this, determined as this, determined as that, and then we go all the way back basically going to have the same kind of thing end up happening with an identifier. And yes, being able to share the one that you originally gave and have the next institution use that same one, that is definitely a best practice for going forward. But it's not going to be something that, that I don't that any, to me, I don't, we can suggest it, we can tell people why it will work, we can say the way it's a good idea, 
It's going to take time for it to be implemented and for everybody to catch on and to get it done. In the meanwhile, we're going to have this other situation. But I mean, it's, 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 so, but it's, I do, it's doable. I mean, the libraries do it with ISDN numbers. Right. right. And, and I mean, so, I just, I just, so why is it not doable in the natural history book? We've just yeah. got to come to a consensus so, and we've just got to do it. Yeah, it's, you know, it's time. That's what we just said. It's time. Here. I just wanted like a hundred years ago. I just said that, yeah. A hundred years ago, we won't be having this discussion. Right. Ten years from now, we won't be having this discussion. We will have made it. We will have evolved a lot, and we will probably move toward the. And I'm just predicting. I'm not saying I think I'm good. Um, we're probably moving towards some type of a library model where we'll have a much better standard. Um, we've just got a lot of fussing to do before we get there, and I think that's going to happen. I mean, we've got to do this if we're moving to the next level of data management in the cloud, um, and, and it's just going to happen. And so, we'll mark it down. In the next 10 or so years, we will resolve or be substantially resolved for this problem. Um, so I'm going to cut this discussion off. We'll go on to tomorrow and let them move their next topic. Thanks, Gil.